if you'll turn with me back to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. We're going to continue in our study on the Olivet Discourse as Jesus gives us prophecy really to live by. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 36 through 42. And so I'll give you a moment to turn there. And I want, as, you, as you're turning, I want you to notice that the title of our study this morning uh, is Jesus' Warning, Be Prepared. This is part one, and we will look at part two uh, next week. So, um, so know that's coming. And I just want to uh, encourage you uh, to read ahead into chapter 25 as we'll be making our way there in another week or so. But now... Notice it says here, Jesus' warning, be prepared, part one. Now, I just want to tell you this. Uh, we're, we're going to see this in our, our text today, that it's actually so very relevant, and it's practical and it's applicable for our lives here in our fast-paced modern America that is growing more secular uh, by the day, um, it is growing more selfish, and, and we, are, we are crowding God out of our country. Any, anybody agree with that? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, even though we're in the South, we're supposed to be in the Bible Belt, but the Bible, but the belt's falling off, okay? And it's not uh, the way it's used to be. So, so uh, this is really going to speak to us today. So let's pick up chapter 24 at verse 36. Now, if you have a red letter edition, it'll all be in red because these are the words of the Lord Jesus. Now, he starts here at verse 36. He says, But of that day, talking about the day he returns. Now, notice what he says here. But of that day and hour, no one, no man, you could say no person, knows. He says, Not even the angels of heaven now, my New American Standard and other translations will have uh, nor the sun. Now, if you have a King James, you won't see that in there. But right out in the margin of your Bible, uh, Mark thirteen thirty two, because it's a parallel verse and it's actually found in there. Okay? So, it says, nor the sun, but the Father alone or only. For the coming, that's that word parousia, means the second coming. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of, who's it say? Noah. Now, you need to mark that. It's important. Now, notice what Jesus says. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the what? ark. Mm. Jesus mentions a guy named Noah and he mentions an ark. Mm, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Now, notice he says, and they did not understand or they knew not until the flood came and, and took them all away. So will be the coming parousia of the Son of Man be. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, or literally the hand mill, uh, and uh, one in her home. One will be taken, and one will be left. And then he says in verse 42, Therefore, be on the alert, or watch, King James says, or keep watch, NIV says. Present tense command calls for continual action. You could translate, continually be awake, be alert, be on guard. For you do not know which day your Lord, your curios, is coming. Let's bow together. Father, thank you for the time this morning of worship. God, of coming into your presence. And now as we open your infallible word, I pray that you would open our hearts. Father, that you would speak in a powerful way. And that, Lord, again, if there's somebody here today that's not saved, I pray today would be their time of salvation. So, Lord, just take away all the hindrances, all distractions for the next few little while, Lord. And would you just speak to hearts through your Holy Spirit. And, Lord, if you do anything good, and we know that you do, we'll give you honor and glory. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Now, as we work our way through our text, 
Notice that first of all, in verse 36, Jesus is going to explain to us, first, the, the limitation, and this is in reference to His second coming. Now, notice again, let's begin reading at verse 36, and notice what He says here to us. He begins here, and He says, but of that day, and then He says, notice, not only of that day, uh, and an hour, which is Jesus' way of, of, of saying an exact time and a date um, and a moment of His second coming. Okay? So He's making this, He's letting us know uh, r- r- kind of precise here. He says, notice He says, and it's interesting, He says that no one or no man, or you could say no uh, woman, uh, or it's a kind of a generic uh, con- uh, construction here, Notice what he says here, and, and, and this is interesting. He says, no one knows. So clearly, what Jesus tells us, nobody knows the exact precise day and time that he's coming back again. Okay? And, and that's from Jesus. Now, notice he further strengthens this by mentioning, notice what else he says, not even the angels, notice he says, in heaven. So, I want you to realize that the Bible tells us that there are certain angels, we know them as cherubim and seraphim, that they hover around God's throne all the time. They're in His presence. And you know what, what, what Jesus says? They don't even know when He's coming back. And then, you know what, I think about the angel uh, Gabriel. You know, he's God's messenger angel, always standing in his presence, ready to be sent out uh, and, and, dis- and, and dispatched at a moment's notice to take a message. And I think about Michael and, you know, uh, uh, Gabriel, and you know what? Gabriel doesn't know. Kind of interesting, isn't it? But now... As I mentioned earlier, in my New American Standard and many translations, uh, the next phrase is, nor the sign. Now, now, as I said, if you have a King James, you won't see that phrase, but if you look in Matthew 13, 32, it has that exact phrase. In fact, it's the same almost Greek construction that Mark has, that Matthew has. Now, why the difference? Well, there's a difference in manuscripts, Okay. And I, but I tell people, uh, the most ancient, the best Greek manuscripts have nor the sun in it. The, probably the greatest Greek scholar that I know the Southern Baptists have ever produced, and really one of the greatest in America, was a guy named A.T. Robertson. And A.T. Robertson said that phrase, nor the sun, should be in here. And you know what? If A.T. Robertson says it, that's good enough for me. Okay? But my point in telling you of the parallel passage in Mark 13 is you don't have to struggle with textual issues uh, because, listen, uh, we've got such a great Bible uh, and, and, and you find it there in Mark. Okay? Now, notice what he says here. Now, this is interesting. Not only the angels know, but you know what he says? During Jesus' time... On earth, we call it his incarnation, as he's sitting there on the Mount of Olives there in a private conversation with his disciples, he lets us know that he didn't know the exact time of his coming. Now, now look at the end. He says, but the Father alone, or the Father uh, only, so he says, Nobody knows, men don't know on earth, angels in heaven don't know. When Jesus was here in the incarnation, he said that he didn't know. He said only the Father knows. Okay? Now, I want to stop here for a moment because I know there would people, I've had people ask me about this. It's kind of odd, and, and they want me to talk about the issue of how can Jesus, if He's God in human flesh, He's co-equal with the Father, shares in the attributes, the the divine attributes of omniscience and uh, omnipotence and all with the Father, then how could Jesus not know when He was coming back? Okay? Well, if you notice in your outline, I put put this in here. Scholars talk about the kenosis. Okay? And I put it in your outline. 
Uh, and it's found, it comes from the book of Philippians chapter 2, uh, in verses uh, 6 through 8. And, and we had studied this in Philippians back some time ago. And, and, it, and don't turn there, but, but uh, the word kenosis comes from a word that means to empty. Okay? And, and if you look, uh, don't look there, but in the New American Standard, it says that he emptied himself. The NIV said he said, made himself nothing. Uh, King James says, but made himself of no re- reputation. And that's the emptying part. So what I want you to understand, when Jesus came and was born uh, and put in the womb of Virgin Mary and he was born... He voluntarily laid aside some of his divine uh, prerogatives. He restricted some of those attributes that he had with the Father. He willingly did what the Father wanted. And so while he was on earth, he, he willingly uh, knew what the Father wanted him to know. Okay? Now, now I want you to understand this, and it's really important that, I, and I agree with scholars, that after his resurrection and we went back to heaven, now he, of course, knows when he's coming back. Okay? But he voluntarily restricted that during his incarnation. Now, you know, I know that for people in our Western world, in our rational scientific world here in America, you know, we think that if we can break everything down in its most basic elementary uh, uh, principles and, and elements and, and, and all the components, then we can really fully grasp something and understand it, and we can make it fit in our, in our secular, our rational, our, our box of, our, of scientific knowledge. Okay? So people say, well, well, how can he be God but not know it? And, and here's what I've said before. There are just things in Scripture, they're just mysteries that God has that we just won't quite understand. We, can't just, we just can't fathom everything that God knows. And you know, there's just times, I tell people, you've got to just do like Moses. There's times when you just got to take your shoes off and just humble yourself and just hit your knees and just say, man, I, I, I'm just on holy ground. I, I, I don't. I can't explain it all, and, and 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 you know, I tell people that if you could understand everything about God, He wouldn't be much of a God. His wisdom is much higher than ours. His ways are higher. In fact, scholars call it inscrutable. That means you can't really figure God out, and you can't really know everything that He knows. Okay. Now, you know, liberals and skeptics will say, well, if Jesus didn't know when he was coming back, well, how does we know what he tells us here in chapter 24? How do we know that's right when he says all this prophecy stuff? Well, first of all, I say he's going to know that because he's God. Okay? And secondly, I say this, that Jesus' point here is that No one knows when he was coming back, but what he does here is he's preparing us by giving us signs and conditions that will characterize the times in the last age before he comes. And you know, I say this all the time, it's obviously every day that passes is one day closer to him coming back, right? That just makes sense. But... When you begin to look at what's happening on a global scale with the chaos and all the stuff, it really looks like we are getting closer to what he's describing. Okay? Now, having said that, let's go to our second main point. Now, sit down and take long, get it. All right, we're going to go a little further on this one. All right. Now, first of all, we have talked about the limitation. Now, secondly, in 37 through 41, we're going to see the illustration. And I want you to um, realize this is so relevant and important for us uh, on so many levels. I wish I had about, I wish I had about three hours this morning. Did y'all eat really well? Breakfast? Okay. I'm just seeing if you're listening. Okay. Now... Now, look with me at verse 37. 
Jesus talking, he says, For the coming of the Son of Man, talking about himself, will be just like the days of Noah. Now, what Jesus does is he calls our attention back to the Old Testament days of Noah himself. Now, put this in your outline. Don't turn there now, but I encourage you to go back and read. You can find it in Genesis chapter 6 through 10. Okay? And, and those chapters in Genesis focus on, on Noah uh, and his family. And realize, folks, that Jesus, by mentioning Noah and by using him as an illustration, he reminds us, he tells us that Noah was a real, actual, historical person who really lived. Okay? Not some fictional character, not some myth, not some, not some uh, you know, metaphor. He's a real guy who lived at a real time. Uh, in fact, let me tell you this, always remember this, the first 11 chapters of Genesis is literal history. Okay? We take it all, every word. Now, some people say, well, I don't know. No, it's every word. Okay? Now, now, here Jesus tells us that there's direct parallels and similarities between what was happening in Noah's day before the flood and what's going to happen in our world before he comes back. And there really are a lot of parallels between the two. For example, even though Jesus doesn't touch on this in this particular section, but we know that the reason God destroyed the world with a flood in Noah's day was because of what? But the world, the humanity had gotten so corrupt, so vile, so perverted, so anti-God that, that God just said, man, I, I can't take all this mess anymore. So he wipes the entire, almost the humanity out uh, in judgment. Okay? And just like today, in our world, in our culture, our culture has become, you know, they call it woke today, but, but I'm telling you, our culture has become so anti-God, so anti-Christian, so perverted in what it teaches is right, and, and so sinful and vile and wicked, you know, it, that when we try to stand for the truth of what the Bible says, the press, the media, academia, uh, uh, all the world tries to say, we're the bad guys and you need to be quiet. They want to silence us. They want, they want to tell you, you guys are wrong. You're hate mongers because you're, you believe that old book and you need to get rid of it. And you know, our, our country here in America, I, I, I've seen some stuff you know, that's supported by our government that I just think I never would have thought our government would do all that kind of stuff. And, and, and I want you to understand that, that God is going to have to judge America one day. You know, it may not be near the end of the world. It may just be the end of America as we know it because eventually we're going to be absorbed into a one-world government and lose our sovereignty. And, and, and that may be what this next generation sees. Now, let's go on. I could talk more, but I want to go on. I want to let you out before 2 o'clock. Okay, so you still listen. I hadn't lost you yet. Okay. Now, let's look at verse 38. Okay, and notice that Jesus gives us the first parallel, a first similarity uh, between Noah's generation and and the generation to come in the last days. And it sounds so much like us today. Now, first, we're going to talk about preoccupation and busyness. Okay? Because I know there's nobody out here busy. You don't live fast, do you? No. you got plenty of leisure time. Okay? Now, look at, look at verse 38. He says, Now, for as in those days before the flood... Now, look in your outline, and just for and some of you like this writing in your Bible. The word flood there is katakolusmos. 
and we bring it right into English as cataclysm. Okay? And, and, and again, let me just say that Jesus understood the flood as a real, actual, historical event. Because there's people who say, well, I, I don't believe in that. Well, you know, if Jesus said it happened, that's good enough for me. But you know the fossil record bears it out. Yeah, I mentioned that last week. When, when you look at all the evidence, it supports the geology of the rocks. Everything supports a worldwide flood. And, and so we, we know that, that, you know, it happened. Jesus said it happened. Okay? So notice what he tells us here. And, and this is interesting. He says, now, for in those days before the flood, before the thing hits, they were eating and they were drinking. Now, you know, it doesn't mean they're just drinking alcohol, but what it means is they're just doing what you got to do in life because you, you got to eat to live, right? And, and you know, I, I, sometimes I wish that we could do like a camel. Wouldn't it be good if you could just eat like maybe twice a week or twice a month? It'd save a lot of money and it'd save a lot of time. But you got to eat and you got to drink, you got to stay hydrated, you got to do all those things. And, and, and this, what he's talking about here. It's just, it's just the everyday stuff of life. They're eating and they're drinking and they're marrying and they're giving in marriage. See, people are just, you know, uh, and people are getting married today. And, 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 and that's, in fact, that's God's plan as long as it's a man and a woman. Nothing else is acceptable. Now, I know that's heresy and I know that's, that's, that's supposed to be hate speech today. But the only marriage that God recognizes as being right is a man and a woman. Nothing else. And I and I'm not trying to pick a fight, but you just gotta you can't you can't give in to the culture that wants you to do that. So so in the end days, and we can say, boy, they really are giving in marriage nowadays. There's a lot of different ones, but but notice what he says here. He says, until the day that Noah entered uh, the the ark. Now, folks, here's something you got to remember is that Noah built the ark, and according to Second Peter, he preached for 120 years building the ark. Okay? And the only converts he really won was his sons and his, and his daughter-in-laws. Okay? Why? Was Noah a bad preacher? I, I don't think he was. It was just the fact that because the people of his day, they were busy, they were self-absorbed in their life, and they had no time for God, for spiritual things, for eternal things. They didn't want to hear all that stuff because, listen, they were too busy. They didn't want to hear all that old stuff. Sound familiar? You better believe it. Because we're trying to be silenced in America for Christianity and what God says. Now, now I'm, I'm going to step on toes just a little bit here. Mine too. A, a little. We're gonna, I, I just want to say this. Yeah, you know, we, we really stay too busy in America. And then parents. You know, uh, parents today have bought in to what our world says, the trap of our world says about how you parent today. Uh, and there's a guy named John Roseman. If you've never read any of his stuff, you're to Google him. Uh, and he just has really great stuff. And, and he talks about how we just, the parents today, have bought into this thing that our job is to make our children, we need to pet them and pamper them and please them and give them everything they need because we want them to be so happy all the time. And we have made them the center of our marriages and our, 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 our home. And, 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 you know, the truth is, is that God says when he gives you children, our job is to grow them, train them, equip them, and help them to live godly, productive lives for the kingdom in this world. Okay? But you know what? One of the things you can do for your children is to make them realize, and John Roseman points this out, is to make them realize that they aren't the center of the universe. 
and the world doesn't revolve around them. And I always like to remind children that the government doesn't owe you anything at all. In fact, the government doesn't really produce anything. I've told kids for this before who said, well, the government will take it. Well, the government really doesn't do anything but take our tax money to do that. And so, you know, you've got, these, you've got this culture around us that just uh, thinks everything's about them. And you got parents, and you know, I, I, we got all these sports teams playing everywhere all the time. You got all this stuff going on. You know, massive stadiums are filled on Saturday, and but houses of worship are empty on Sunday. You know, they used to say the most wasted space in America is a church that sits empty six days a week. But you know what? I think the most wasted space in America is great big football stadiums that's used 10, 11 times a year. Spent millions and zillions of dollars on it. Sent a lot of missionaries out for that, couldn't you? Now, am I saying it's wrong to go up to Clemson and watch or go down to Carolina and watch? Oh, no, I love football. Football got me through school. I didn't go on an academic scholarship. Okay? So am I against sports? No, but sports have become a god in America and see what's happened with the family. We run here, we run there, we got to hear mama works by two, daddy works, they work more hours so they can buy a bigger house. Don't ever stay in it much because they out working all the time. And they're getting this, they got to have this, and got to drive this, and got to wear this, and we're just go, 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 go. And, and before you know it, God's just crowded out. Don't have time to read your Bible. We got generations that don't know anything about Scripture. Don't know it. Don't don't know what they should believe. Buy into this culture, and and that's what happened in the days of old uh, Noah. See, they got got in the rat race. You ever feel like you're in the rat race? Stinks, don't it? And and we neglect the spiritual things of God, and. If we have anything, God just gets the leftovers. Think about it. People work hard all week and they'll roll into church and they can't hold to keep their eyes open. They're so tired. Maybe give them $20, but they just spent $75 on lunch the day before. Just amazing. We're just so backwards. That's what happened before the flood hit. Now, go to verse 39. Here's the second similarity. First, there was preoccupation, busyness. Now, secondly, there was indifference. Now, look what he says. And they did not understand or they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. He says, so will the coming, the parousia of the Son of Man be. Now, folks, I want you to make sure you get this. Here Jesus reminds us of the tragedy of that ancient generation who were perished, they were killed in the flood because they were caught off guard. They didn't see it coming. But here's the thing. Now listen to me. Everybody look up here. I don't want you to see this. I know it's kind of hard to look at me in the morning, but listen to me. I want you to get this. Here's the thing. Their lack of knowledge and ignorance was not due to to a lack of information or communication. Does everybody hear that? Some of you are kind of looking at me. Listen to me. It wasn't that they hadn't been told. They just didn't listen. Because think about this. For 120 years, Noah preached to the people, to his generation. And you know what? They could walk out... And they could see Noah methodically building the ark for 120 years. Now, 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 it looked like a really a, a modern day ocean liner. We, we we got some pictures up here from the from the Genesis thing. Now, how many people have been to the ark encounter? I haven't been. I want to go because Anthony's been. He says it's actually it's just absolutely amazing. And and, um, and and that's a picture he took. Isn't that isn't amazing? Now, can you imagine he's building that thing out probably on land 
not near a big body of water. And, and, and you know, most, most scholars believe that it had never rained at that time because the earth was watered from beneath. And it had more of a canopy effect. And that's one reason people could live longer, because you didn't have all the, all the sun and all the stuff that was aging you. Now, now, I want you to think with me. You, you don't think Noah caught some grief in his time? People walk out there, oh, look at, look at that idiot, laughing at him. You know, oh, you take that God stuff. You're a, you're a fanatic. Are you a fundamentalist? Well, you know what? I believe the fundamentals of the faith. I believe what the Bible says. Does that make you bad? Not in God's eyes. We're supposed to believe what the Word says. And I, I'm just sure, boy, they just, they just gave him a hard time. And think about it. For 120 years, he preaches and he preaches and, and days come and months come and years come and nothing happens. And they probably think, well, uh, he's just full of it. Nothing, nothing happens. And then, one day... Noah and his family, they get in the ark. The animals are in. They get in the ark. And you remember what the Bible says? Who shut the door? God. You know how many doors they were? One. You know the ark is a picture of salvation? There's one way in, and that's the only way. And the ark is salvation. Outside of it, you're lost. And it's what God does. God shut the door. The rain started. And then the floodgates break open. But it was too late. And the people literally, figuratively, spiritually, you know what they did? They missed the boat. And you know what? They perished, and Jesus says, that's exactly what's going to happen in the last days. Now, let's look at 40 and 41. Here, Jesus further stresses this point. Now, thus far, he's warned us about preoccupation, being busy, being consumed with our culture, and what's going on. Number two, he's he's warned us about indifference and apathy. Boy, apathy kills the church. If you can get people to come, you know, we were talking this morning a little bit. The Internet's a wonderful thing that people can watch at home online, but there's a lot of folks, well, I'll just stay in my pajamas and watch it in my easy chair and won't go to church, but I can still see it. Now, I'm glad people can see it, shut-ins and all. But you know, the Bible says... Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. There's just something about gathering together with God's people that you need. Can't duplicate it over the Internet. Now, am I saying people are bad for watching it? No, because there's people watching it right now, and I love you, and I'm glad you can watch it. And they would be here if they could, but there's some that can't. But now, thirdly, Jesus talks about separation Due to folks who aren't ready. Now, now look at verses 40 and 41. He says, now, then there will be two men, notice he says, in the field. That's, everybody was farmers. And, 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 and that's the way of talking about, they're going to be at work. Okay? They're working. Alright? Now, notice what happens. And one will be taken... All right? And then one will be left. Now, there's some scholars who will say the one first one taken was taken for judgment, and the, and the one left was taken for salvation. And then others will say, no, it's the other way around. They'll say, well, the first one was taken for salvation, and the other one's left for judgment. I tend to agree with that. I think they're taken out. Uh, this, may be a, this may be a hint of the rapture. Okay? But here's the thing. Doesn't matter which one way we take it, because the end result will be the same. Because what he's telling us, one guy was ready and one guy wasn't. That's what he's saying. One guy was prepared; he knew he was ready and to meet the Lord. The other one wasn't. Okay. Now, 
Look at verse 41. Didn't leave you out. Two women will be grinding at the, at the mill or the hand mill. In that ancient day, that's what you couldn't get out your, your, your loaf of bread. You, you, you couldn't go to, to, the, to the grocery store. You had to make it. And, and they would grind it with a little hand grindstone. And, and, and you know what, they, what, the, what happens here? Notice one will be taken, all right? And, and one will be left, all right? And again, um, y- y- you know what? Whichever order you take it, one's saved, one's not, one's left behind. One wasn't ready, and one was. But the point is they're separated because one's ready, one's not. Now, let me just tell you something. When you look at this text, it demands us to ask ourselves are the question, are we ready if the Lord should come back? If He comes back and gets us in the rapture, would you be ready? Would you, would you, be, would you be called in a, in a way that you, you wouldn't want to be called? So, Jesus really... Listen... Either he's going to come back and get us in the air, or you're going to die. Uh, you know what? I wouldn't mind being, being raptured, would you? I think that'd be pretty good. But the thing is, may not be when we think, but one thing's for sure, if he doesn't come back, we're all going to die. We need to be ready. Now, look at verse 42. Okay? Now, here's our third and final main point. Now, Thus far, we, we talked about the limitation. We talked the illustration that he gives with Noah. Now we're going to talk about the application because you don't know when this thing's going to happen. You know, I, I do believe in a pre-trib rapture, but there's a lot of great, good conservative scholars who say, no, I, I, we, don't, we don't see it that way. It's not written in stone like people want to think it, make it is. I, but I, I, I still think a rapture is going to happen. But here's the thing. Whether he comes back to rapture and then comes back or it all happens at one time, just know this. It's going to happen. And we need to be ready. That's the point here. We need to be in a, in a state of readiness, spiritually speaking. Look what he says in verse 42. Notice he says, Therefore... Now, the New American Standard says, be on the, on the alert. Okay? King James says, watch therefore. NIV says, keep watch. I actually like the e- ESV here. It says, stay awake. Boy, I like that. I like to say that in preaching sometimes to people. Wake up. Your eyes kind of get glazed over. Yeah, I know how it is when you can sit down and you get still. And especially if you're taking some medicine. Sometimes I just want to get people up, make them do some jumping jacks, just jump around and uh, wake them up a little bit. But now what he tells us here is, is watch, stay awake, present tense command. It means continual action. It means you can translate continually, habitually stay awake. The point here is is that you've got to make it a lifestyle. Notice what he says here. He says, therefore, continually, ongoingly, be alert at all times. You can translate so many different ways, present tense, for you do not know which day you're curious. Your Lord is coming. So he says, because we don't know, we need to be ready all the time. And you know, if you think about it, it's a good thing that the Lord, one scholar pointed this out, and I agree. He said, it's really good that we don't know, because if we knew the exact time, we would get so lackadaisical about it, and we would procrastinate about it, and we, we, would, we knew that we wouldn't be ready, would we? If we knew, we, we, hey, it's always imminent. That means you've got to be ready because it could be at any time. And you know what? I always say this. It starts with salvation. If you're not saved, you're listening to me, whether you're watching online or you're in here and you know that you're not saved, you know that if you died, you're not ready, you need to get ready. And then there's others here. You'll say, Pastor Jim, I've been saved. I know that I'm right with the Lord. 
but I'm not, I'm not really ready. I'm not where I should be. Well, you know what? There's no time like the present to get ready. To live for the Lord, to give your life wholly to Him, and, and, and to make sure that we're all busy. You know, you got to work. The Lord expects us to work. we got to make a living. But you know what? In the midst of it, you can't let it consume you because you always got to have your eyes on the sky. you got to always have your heart ready to meet the Lord. I wish I had time on Sunday morning. I see, I look out here and I see so many people and I'd just love to go sit down and talk with you for 10 minutes a piece and just, hey, what's going on? What you're facing? What, how's it going? How, where are you reading in your Bible? What, how's your quiet time? What, what's, what's, what's the Lord speaking to you about? Of course, if I did that, I'd be here for six months. But you know what? The Lord always has plenty of time for you. The Lord always wants you. You never have to pray about, should I pray more? You never have to pray about, well, I wonder if the Lord wants me to serve and give and, and, and help His kingdom, help His church. You don't even have to pray about those things. They're givens. So the question is not about what the Lord's going to do. The question is, what about us? Am I ready? You know, there's a day when the generation of Noah's folks, they woke up. They said, you know, it's just another day, just another day. And then the rain started. And it was too late. We don't want to make the same mistake. Because if we're not getting too close to the end, I, boy, I, I tell you, it, it sure really does look like it. And you know what? We need to be ready.